Well, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you here to our Sharon SDA uh, church service. For those of you that are here, those that are online, get prepared for a, just a wonderful presentation, get together from the Word of God. Uh, I'm thinking about what the psalmist said in the book of Psalms. He says, I was glad when they said unto us, let us go into the house of the Lord. And as we think about coming to the house of the Lord, really, it's not necessarily this, this physical house right here, but it's our house, our hearts. And so when God comes into our hearts, he makes a tremendous difference. So I'd like to thank everybody for being here. We pray that you will receive a special Sabbath day blessing as a result of being here and be the blessing to others that God has called you to be for such a time as this. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your love, for your mercy, for your faithfulness toward your people, your creation. We pray, Heavenly Father, those that have come into this particular place today, this house, that you will bless each and every one of us, Father God. There may be visitors that are here also, visitors online, offline. And Lord, we just pray that as the word of God is spoken, as this service is, is, is to give glory and honor to you, that people will be blessed. And as a result of that, they will be drawn closer and closer to you. So Heavenly Father, we just thank thee for your love, your mercy, your kindness, your faithfulness toward us. We pray, Lord, that we will be blessed and we will be the blessing to others that you called us to be for such a time as this. We will give you all the glory and honor for being the great God that you are, because we ask all these blessings in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Hey kids, I'm Dr. Roscoe Shields Jr., the pastor here at Sharon. And listen, I want to welcome everyone to Sharonia. Hey, here at Sharon, we're so excited. And I tell you what, I thank God it's Sabbath. Thank God it's Sabbath. Listen, we've got something very special planned for you over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I want you to, I almost want to tell you what it is, but shh. It's a secret. You're going to really like it. You're going to really enjoy it. I know that the adults are going to enjoy it as well. But today, we once again, we partnered with the people at Crosstown. And today, Brittany and Justice have a very special message just for you. So come on to the edge of your seat. I want you to pay very close attention because this is about to be amazing. All righty. So we'll see you guys on the next side. Hey, Brittany, come on. Lead us into worship. Hey everyone, my name is Brittany and we're so excited you're joining us today. Today we're talking about the story of the golden calf. In this story, the Israelites turned away from God who had just delivered them from slavery in Egypt and they started worshiping a golden calf that they had made themselves. And this sounds ridiculous to us, but if we're not careful, what happened to the Israelites could happen to us. They forgot what God did for them, they got distracted, and they turned away from their relationship with Him, going right back to their old sin. And we may not worship a golden cow, but sometimes we get distracted and focus on other things so much that we forget who we are in Jesus and what He has done for us. So today we are saying, every day I am who Jesus says I am. And now we're going to take some time to watch a Bible story together. Like I said earlier, today's story is about the golden calf. So let's check it out. After God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, God invited Moses to join him on top of a nearby mountain so they could talk. So Moses left and went to talk to God. The Israelites waited and waited until they felt like they had waited long enough. They found Moses' brother Aaron and said they were tired of waiting for Moses, and they were tired of waiting for God. They told Aaron to make them new gods. So Aaron asked them to take off their gold jewelry and give it to him. Aaron melted down the gold and made a golden idol that looked like a calf. Aaron presented the idol to the Israelites and told them to worship it instead of God. 
the Israelites offered their sacrifices to their new gods because they were tired of waiting for Moses and they were tired of waiting for God. Meanwhile, up on the mountain, the Lord was giving instructions on how to live, but he knew what was happening down below. God told Moses, Go down to the Israelites. They have forgotten that I brought them out of Egypt. They are worshiping an idol made in the shape of a calf. The Lord was angry and wanted to punish the Israelites, but Moses stood up for them. Please, don't be angry. They are making a bad choice. Let me talk to them. So the Lord sent Moses down the mountain with all of the instructions they had talked about written on two stone tablets. When Moses saw them worshiping the idol, he was so angry he threw down the stone tablets and found his brother Aaron. Aaron, why did you make this idol for these people to worship? Aaron told him that they were tired of waiting for Moses and they were tired of waiting for God. So they made their own gods. Moses took the calf idol that Aaron had made and melted it in a fire. Then he reminded the Israelites. It wasn't a calf that brought you out of Egypt. It was God. He is the only one that deserves your worship. Moses went back to the mountaintop to ask God to forgive them for their foolish worship. The Israelites turned away from God and worshiped a golden calf because they got tired of waiting. They got distracted. Moses was only up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, and by the time he came back down, the Israelites had already created a statue of a golden calf and began worshiping it. So let's talk about that for a second because when you look at the big picture, 40 days and 40 nights is not a very long time. But when you're waiting for 40 days and 40 nights, it can feel like forever. Our friend Justice is going to be talking to us a little bit more about our story right now. So let's take a look. How many of you have ever wanted a really cool brand new toy or video game? You ask your parents for it and they say something like, maybe. So, as often as you can, you try to sneak it into the conversation. Your mom says something like, Hey Jimmy, how was your sleepover? Then you say, Uh, it was great, Mom. We made a pillow fort, and we spent the night in it. You know, speaking of Fortnite, Kevin let me play on his account, and it's pretty fun. So, eventually you finally get this new toy or video game, and you play with it non-stop. You go to school and talk about it with your friends, you post about it on social media, and you just think about it all the time. But what do you do when it gets boring? Typically, we just move on to the newest and coolest thing because that's what everyone's talking about and getting excited over. You know, that's a lot like what happened in our Bible story today. At Mount Sinai, Moses climbed to the top of the mountain to speak with God. While the rest of the Israelites waited below, they decided that Moses was taking too long and they told Aaron to make idols for them to worship. So he did. Why is that? Well, we actually have something working against us. It's what the Bible calls our flesh. I know, that word sounds kind of gross. So, we'll call it our sin nature. It's our tendency to go our own way instead of God's way. And it began when Adam and Eve sinned for the first time in the Garden of Eden. Our sin nature is something that traps us and keeps us from living like Jesus. It's kind of like it has us chained up. Our sin nature? is actually something that we're born with. The Bible even says that we were slaves to it, living selfishly and far from God. That's why we need to be born again into the family of God. When we become born again, our old spirit is made new and God's spirit comes to live on the inside of us. And he's constantly trying to teach us how to live like Jesus. It's like these chains that bind us to our sin nature have been released. That's why what Jesus did for us is so amazing. It allows us to be set free from our old way of doing things. So stop trying to find fulfillment in earthly things like video games or your friends and commit to growing in your relationship with him. If this seems like it might be really hard for you, maybe your next step is to simply ask Jesus to give you a real desire to seek him above all else. His Holy Spirit will comfort you and guide you into all truth. Justice talked about how just like the Israelites, we can become distracted and take our focus off of Jesus and put it onto whatever we think will bring us the most happiness. But truthfully, real lasting joy can only be found in our relationship with Jesus. 
So I would encourage you to take some time with your parents or small group leaders to talk about what it is that tends to distract you from your relationship with Jesus and what you can do to help yourself stay focused on Jesus. So that's it for this week. And remember, every day we are who Jesus says we are. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time. fulfillment in earthly things like video games or your friends and commit to growing in your relationship with him if this seems like it might be really hard for you maybe your next step is to simply ask jesus to give you a real desire to seek him above all else his holy spirit will comfort you and guide you into all truth justice talked about how just like the israelites we can become distracted and take our focus off of jesus and put it onto whatever we think will bring us the most happiness. But truthfully, real lasting joy can only be found in our relationship with Jesus. So I would encourage you to take some time with your parents or small group leaders to talk about what it is that tends to distract you from your relationship with Jesus and what you can do to help yourself stay focused on Jesus. So that's it for this week. And remember, every day we are who Jesus says we are. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time. hard to recover from the brutal genocide against the Tutsi in 1994, but refugees continue to flood into Rwanda from neighboring Congo. Terrorists often threaten, beat, or kill adults and children as they attempt to escape the turmoil. After decades of war, many children are homeless and missing parents or siblings. Yeah, they say, no, it's a treat. We're not so to you. If they put my gun here, they say, no, you should pick up. Uh, in that moment, I remember I, I did not know how to pray, but in my heart, I just kneeled down, held it down, then I said, Oh, please, my God, help me if I escape this place. I should serve you all the time. I, my old brothers and sisters are still in Congo because when the war was broken, uh, I, I separated with them. They, run, they ran away where I don't know. Until now, I, I have never seen them. The number of people fleeing Congo in 2016 surpassed the number of refugees fleeing Syria in the same time period. Yet the world knows little of the current refugee crisis in Rwanda. Now the total number of people in camps is nearly 80,000. These refugees are trapped in desperate conditions in makeshift homes with no running water, sewer, or electricity. The refugees do not own land, so have no way to raise their own food or keep their own animals. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees provides enough for one meal per day per person. This is not a good place for human beings to live. To find something to eat, um, something to trace, it is so hard. The refugees desperately want a way out of the camps, but lack opportunity. Relief organizations offer school in the camps until grade nine. Rwandan high schools are located in the cities, a long ways away from the camps. Often when returning from class, the students find nothing to eat since the family has already eaten the one meal provided. Then the students have to get up early and walk back to school on an empty stomach. Brave girls who walk as much as five miles one way risk assault or rape. It happens routinely. This in this life that we love, if you are uneducated people, 
you can you cannot get anything. In 2015, the Tigerson started Impact Hope an organization that sends at-risk refugee youth to safe boarding schools in Rwanda. This gives the teens a chance for a high school education and also a place to be empowered by hope. We feel passionate about helping these refugee students because we have been so impacted by them out of their dire situations, the hope and the crisis of life that they're living. By helping them, we've been incredibly blessed ourselves. For most of the graduating refugees, a high school diploma isn't enough to secure a job. In 2017, Impact Hope added a summer trade school program. The summer program teaches permaculture, hairdressing, sewing, plumbing, and electrical. These practical trades equip students with a realistic way to make a living when they graduate, a way to finally break free from the refugee camps. Impact Hope is making a difference because all of our graduates so far have either received university scholarships for continuing education or they've received employment. In the first year of the trade program, 350 students attended the summer trade school program. Now, around 600 sponsored students are enrolling in the trade schools. Still, more needs to be done. With a donation of $50 a month, we can immediately take a child out of a camp and place them in a safe, secure boarding school. A sponsor gives a young person an education and a vocational skill, plus safety and enough to eat. And all that in an environment that will build relationships with Jesus and create a life of service to those around them. And there are even more students who need help. Each year, over 10,000 children from the refugee camps miss out on a high school education and the chance to learn a life-changing trade. Right now, the doors to Rwanda are open, but given their past, we know that those doors can shut. This is the time to do the work in Rwanda. There are other ways you can help too. You can volunteer, pray, and share with others how students in Rwanda's refugee camps find hope. Visit impact-hope.org to find out more. You can impact hope. Sabbath. My name is Alyssa Johnston, and I'm here with my husband, Wyatt, and we're so excited to be here with you this morning and give you a quick update of how Impact Hope is doing. And so Wyatt and I actually met each other through Impact Hope in Rwanda at the 2019 um, Summer Trade Program. So it's something that's very close to our hearts and we have a passion to serve over in Africa, and Wyatt will tell you a little bit more about that later. But I think the biggest thing with um, Impact Hope is that, as you saw in the video, we're sending students or you know, young, young people who are living in the refugee camps to safe Christian boarding schools. You saw the girls who are now in a safe place and the young men too, and this is huge. But one of the things that we've been seeing after six years as um, an organization is not only the need for an education, but the, the goal is to get them out of the refugee camps, out of poverty, and out of the refugee status, really. And to do this, it goes beyond just a high school education. So we started beginning the summer vocational trade program so that we can teach our students to sew, to cook, to do hair, and that way we can help them start businesses. So we've actually started another program. We send them to vocational trade school after they graduate high school, and they can learn different trades. And then from there, we have a business coach on the ground that is working with our graduates, helping them start their own businesses. So we have students that it's really exciting. We're seeing them graduate and we're seeing them um, graduate from their vocational trade program and then start their own businesses like farming. And we have several students who have started their own bakery and um, let me read some more tailoring shops. We have a student that's 
a plumber in a local school district and hairdressers. And these students are now empowered to go out and create their own jobs and get in revenue. And the beautiful thing about these people is that they are not about themselves. They are all about pouring back into their own families and their communities. We actually have two boys that graduated through Impact Hope and they live in Texas now and they work with Amazon. And they learned about Impact Hope. They were like, they, they saw um, Mindy Tigerson who started Impact Hope and has been here with you guys. They, they called her up and they said, Mindy, Impact Hope, it only costs $50 a month to send a student to school? Wow, like we want to send a student to school. And so together they sponsored a student and Mindy sent them, okay, here's several boys and here's one girl. Which one do you want to sponsor? And they chose the girl because they saw the significance of sending a girl to school too. And so we have students that are not about just taking, but really about putting it back and helping each other, which is beautiful. Thank you, Alyssa. And once again, my name is Wyatt, husband of Alyssa. And uh, yeah, Alyssa, Alyssa touched on about impacting more than just a student. It's not just a, an investment for just them to succeed and get what they want in life. When investing in a student impacts their entire family. This is a very communal faith culture. It is here, but even way amplified in Africa. When a student goes to college, when a student starts a business, when they're able to get a professional job, everything changes for them and their family, and oftentimes many siblings. So I just wanted to touch on that. And uh, so when God puts passions and desires in our heart and they're good, we have an opportunity to follow them. So I just want to make a brief announcement about this, and it's our pleasure to spend our last Sabbath in the United States with you people here. We're actually, on Thursday, Alyssa and I are moving to Malawi near South Africa to uh, take our work there. And there's a lot of work to be done. So, and that's with another organization while Alyssa is still working with Impact Hope and very at being very active. So we're glad to be here with you guys today. Uh, we've seen lives change of students and the change, that's, we call our program Impact Hope because it brings hope. There's it, going through so much trauma, such as a genocide or being a refugee for years, and many of these students are born in refugee camps. They never even knew what it was like to live outside of that lifestyle. But Impact Hope is about bringing hope or making an impact with hope so that they actually can change their lives. So we've seen lots of young men and women change their lives through businesses, through professions, through school. And like the young woman said, being uneducated in this situation, especially as a refugee, where life is even harder and people don't want to talk to you or even touch you, it really makes things different. And it really gives them a sharper sword, an upper edge to be able to carve their way into a market and be able to help themselves and their families. Um, and you can sponsor one of them. $50 a month, it's $600 a year. Uh, that'd be pretty cool if our universities and our, our uh, academies cost that much to send our students <laughs> to school. Amen to that, right? <laughs> well, unfortunately, it's not, that's not so in the United States. However, it's the same for our brothers and our sisters in Rwanda. So we want to offer that to you. We'll be outside. Uh, I think, believe we're having a table set up somewhere. Yeah. Come talk to us. Come ask questions. Uh, Chit-chat. Please. Please do come by. And if you're moved in your heart to sponsor a student, please come out and talk to us, and we'll show you how to do that. Okay, I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Such 
a blessing of the work. Thank you for the work you guys are doing. I feel like I see a family member of mine sitting there. Hi, April. Good to see you. Um, we just want to welcome everyone again to the Sharon Church. We say this is a place where the arms of Christ are always open. And Christ is our friend. And that's our theme for today. My dad, my earthly father, used to say, a friend in need is a friend indeed. And that means that a friend who helps you when you really need help is a true friend. John 14 said, John 15, 12 through 15 says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, than someone would lay down his life for his friends. Christ says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends for all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. So would you join us today in singing about our great friend, Jesus? Friend of God, I am a friend of God. He 
Draw me close to you that says, never let me go. I just want to hear you call me friend. Draw me close. Draw me me close to you. Never let me go. Never let me go. I lay it down again. I lay it all down again. Just to hear you say that I'm your friend. To hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. You are my desire. Do. No one else will do. Because nothing else can take your place. Nothing else can take your place. We just want to feel the warmth of your embrace. To feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find the way. Help me find a way, bring me back to you. And what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. Take it to the Lord in prayer.
Let us go to the Lord in prayer. I know you're saying, why is she standing there with her mask on? It's because I wear it all day at work, and I just came from work. But this mask will not hamper prayer going to our Lord and Savior. It will not stop what we need to tell him even though he already knows so let us talk to him whatever your cares are today whatever your burdens are whatever your problems and your concerns are whatever's going on what trouble that you're that's about you just take it to the Lord in prayer. He is the answer. He is our provider. He is our healer. And what he already knows, but he wants you to have a conversation with him about it. And I don't believe anybody can tell him better than me about what's going on, even though he already knows. Father, we come before you and we lay it before you. Sickness, health problems, disease, this virus, whether it be social injustice or this coronavirus. Father, folks are not sure and they're uncertain about what to do about these vaccines. But if they just give it to you, you will guide them in what they need to do. Whatever your concerns are, spoken or unspoken, God will take care of that situation for you. Just continue to lift them 
up and seek his clay, his faith. Father, I give you the Oregon Conference. Yes, it's a running machine, but you are the mechanic who supplies the water, the oil, and the daily maintenance so that it can work. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for our elders in this church. Thank you for our praise team. Thank you for our musicians. Thank you for our communication team. Thank you for the church admin team. And Father, thank you for our Sabbath school teachers to help us who are there to help us learn in our daily life to be more like you. Thank you for Pastor Shields and his family, Lord, for he has heeded the call to come here to share in church to help us to lead our lives in this community in your work. Father, thank you for our ushers and our greeters. Thank you for the men of our church. Thank you for the women of our church. And Father, thank you for our children who will be our future elders. Deaconess, deacon praise team, musicians, communication, church admin. Father, they're our future. Keep them, help them, guide them. And Father, our, I ask that you bless our baptismal candidates because they're coming. They are coming. And I ask that you bless our new members because they're coming too. And when they come to Sharon, may they see you before they see anything else. May they feel your love before they feel anything else. There's a lot going on in this world, Father, and I ask that you bless, take care, keep. There's a lot of disasters going on in diverse places. Father, I is lining up for your soon return. Help us to be ready. Help us to get ready. Guide us in what we need to do to get ready for you. And Father, may we continue to pray without speaking, without ceasing, excuse me. Help us to continually lift each other up. A lot of times we can't help but give you, but we can pray for one another. Father, we thank you for your glory, your honor. Father, we look to you because you're the only help we know. Thank you for your many blessings. In, in, in your name we pray, and we look for your soon return. In your name, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for saving me because I don't know where I would be today if you hadn't saved me, if you hadn't looked down and said, oh, but she is lonely, but she's mine. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glorify your name, and I thank you. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for saving me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. And COVID is running fast through where I work, but it's not come near me because of you, Lord Jesus. I'm safe, and I know I'm safe in you, and I thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Praise your name, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah.
but needless pain. Mm -hmm. Oh, what needless pain. Oh, what needless pain. Oh, what needless pain. We don't need to be in pain. We just need to call on the name of Jesus. Oh, what needless pain. We bear. Can we give it a little praise to our musicians? Aren't they doing it? And they take time. They praise the Lord, too. They might break out into song, and they're praising him, too. So thank you very much for letting God use you. Praise is what I do when I want to be close to you. Whether happy or sad. 
part of the song where we just begin to think of everything that he's done for us. Think of all he brought you through this week. Hallelujah. And this is a time where we give him the praise. We could be dead sleeping in our grave, but we're here. We should give him the praise or the rocks are going to cry out. Praise is what I do. Praise is what I do. Thank you for praising with us this morning. Especially when I'm going through. But I found value in praising God just because. And I, the value, value that I found in that is that when I praise God just because, that I'm, I'm kind of making little deposits. So when trouble does come my way, it makes the going through just a little easier because I began to praise God before I went into that thing. And now, because praise has become a habit of mine, on the outside of trouble, I don't forget how to praise when I'm in trouble. And there's a scripture that says that God inhabits praise. When you inhabit something, that means that that's where you live. So even in trouble, the next scripture says that he's a present help in trouble. So if, I, if God lives with praise and I'm in trouble, then that simply means that all I got to do is just keep my eyes focused on Jesus. Continue to do what I do and let God do what God does. And I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that. Because there's so many times in my life when I thought that I was going to lose my mind. But because I knew how to praise God, I didn't know how I was going to get out, didn't know how I was going to make it through. But because I knew how to praise God, I felt good in the situation. 
our scripture reading today, we want to be uh, intentional about getting you out of here on time. So we're going to go to the word of God real quick and wanted to welcome our visitor here with us, uh, Sister April Wright. Sister Wright, where are you? Where, where are you? Sister Wright, just raise your hand. Praise God. So glad you're here with us today. And um, I hate to be known as a sheep stealer, but if you don't have a church home, we're actively seeking new church members right now. And we'd love to have you part of our fellowship. Praise God for you. And I want to thank everybody for all the birthday wishes, all the love that you showed us last week. Thank you so very kindly for that. And come to find out there was someone who had a birthday right after my sister Craig, and she turned 97. So praise God for you, sister Craig. <laughs> praise God for you. And when she told me she was 97, I was like, this, I know good and well she ain't telling that in the house of the Lord this morning. But praise God for you. I also want to thank Impact Hope for coming by to hang out with us. Alyssa, Wyatt, and Kelly, thank you so kindly for hanging out with us today. And we want to continue to support you, um, uh, your ministry. We understand um, uh, Elder, Elder, told, Elder Olive told us that um, we partnered with you guys in the past. We want to continue with that tradition. So thank you for that. And we do have a table set up for them. And I felt bad about having to do it outside, but of course we're trying to make sure we're following all the proper protocols with this crazy thing that we got called COVID happening. So if you got, I know that some people are parked out front, but if you can just take a detour and go out this door and you'll see where the table is and go by and visit for just a little while. We are being very intentional about our kids program. And so I thank God for what he's doing with that. And I appreciate you guys working with us as we're, we're, we're getting that, uh, that together. So right now, if you go to Sharon, all of our kids, if you go to SharonSDA.net, you're going to see a little button down at the bottom that says uh, Kids Notes. And what we decided to do was every Sabbath when we preach, we, got, we have an interactive kid note so the kids can follow along with the message and kind of make notes and, and interact with the Word of God. And we want you to be able to share that with your parents uh, so that they, just in case they missed the point, you can help share it with them as well. So go to sharingsda.net right now and get that. We also have our prayer guide that's available. We've been talking about that for a little while. And I know that some people um, may be technologically challenged. Don't worry about that. We're figuring out a way to get it printed for you uh, so that you don't have to worry about that. But for everybody else, I want you to go to sharingsda.net slash prayer guide. sharingsda.net slash prayer guide and download that free prayer guide. It's there for you right now. It's up and available. What you see on the screen, they took it down. I guess I took too long. But um, we have an initiative called Hallowed Be Thy Name. We, we have a, a, a holiday coming up, a holy day, a holiday, whatever you want to call it. But we want to maximize this opportunity. And I appreciate Sabbath School. Let me give Sabbath School a plug. If you guys are not attending Sabbath School, please jump online. It's a magnificent thing. Uh, Brother Chambry is doing a great job, and all the teachers are leading out. Thank you all so much. But what we want to do, we want to uh, bring attention to one of the doctrines that we share with our church. It's called the State of the Dead. I know that everybody here is familiar with it, but everybody in the world is not necessarily familiar with the state of the dead. So we're going to set up our parking lot, and what's going to happen, people are going to be able to drive through. It's a drive-through experience, and they're going to stop by each station. We're going to have nine stations set up, and at each station, people will be able to get some information about um, uh, what we believe and what the Bible says about the state of the dead. And it ends with the second coming of Jesus Christ. So it's going to be an interactive um, we can't do it without you, though. So I need volunteers. Of course, we're going to have nine uh, stations, but we need more than nine people. So if you're ready to um, lend a hand to the Lord's work, um, what we want you to do is on our website over the next, probably give me about till Monday on our website, we're going to have a sign-up form. Just go to SharonSDA.net. We're going to have a sign-up form there, and you'll be able to sign up. And probably on tomorrow, just give me to Monday, uh, and you'll be able to sign up and tell us exactly how you are able to help us out. So I know that you're ready to help out and start getting some stuff done. And we also want to recognize um, all the, our visitors who are online with us as well. Thank you guys for joining us today. And we want to um, invite you to be a part of our fellowship as well. Without further ado, let's go right to the Word of God. And that is going to be um, Revelation chapter 2, starting at verses 12 through 17. We are smack dab in the middle of a series that we call Extreme Makeover, the Spiritual Edition. And it's important to us 
to understand that there's some housekeeping stuff we have to do uh, in order to be uh, considered as spiritual creatures or to have uh, a right spirit with God. And so what we wanted to do is just go through the book of Revelation, starting at chapter one and going all the way through. So we're starting with uh, the seven churches and we're looking at church number three today. If you look in your Bibles, if you stand with us as we read the word of God together, that's Revelation chapter two. The last book of the Bible, just flip to the back of your Bible and then turn till you get to chapter two, looking at verse 12. And somebody say, we, we don't turn pages. We're looking at the device. <laughs> Praise God for that, too. There's value in that, too. Revelation chapter 12, uh, chapter two, rather, looking at verse 12, word of God says this. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Pergamum. This is the message from the one with the sharp two edged sword right there. And I love that. That's amazing right there. It says, I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne, yet you have remained loyal to me. You refuse to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. But I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. In a similar way, you have uh, some Nicolaitans among you who follow the same teaching. Repent of your sin or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now I want to read that again so you will really understand the words that are coming out of my mouth. The word of God said, repent of your sin. He's talking to the church at that particular point. He told them, repent of your sin, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them. He's fighting against the falsehoods that have entered into the church. He's not fighting against the church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the type of God we serve. He's going to come in and help, him out, help them out himself. And this is what he said. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches to everyone who is victorious i will give you uh some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven Ooh, that's heavy right there that's heavy right there because we know manna in the sanctuary was placed where in the most holy place in the compartment in the most holy place there was one piece of furniture that was called the what everybody the mercy seat, thank you. Somebody knows that. And in the mercy seat, we have the manna. So that means that as long as there's manna still in heaven, there's mercy still in heaven. I, I told you, you missed your shout moment right there. But also it helps me understand that if the manna still is, is, is working, that means that there's something else that was in the mercy seat that's still working. Ah, oh, we'll get there in just a second. We'll get, I promise you we're going to get right there. This is what he says, and I will give to each one of one a, a white stone, and on the stone will be engraved a new name. Thank the Lord for a new. I think I don't worn this. I've worn this name out. Yes. Engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. There's somebody here today who deeply understands this because nobody understands your trouble. They see you smiling. They see you as you go throughout your day, but they don't understand what you're really dealing with. So without further ado, I want to speak to you briefly on just, uh, just a simple subject entitled, I've Got a Word. Father, bless us now as we enter into your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I remember I have a family that enjoys hunting. I still have family members to this day that actually still hunt. And I remember going hunting as a, as a little boy, and I didn't like it very much. So I was like, okay, it's cold out here, and, and we're out here in the woods, and why? And I remember my dad, he would bring home uh, uh, venison, deer, or whatever it is, and he would lay it out on the floor, and he would dress it right there in the household. And I'm saying to myself, this is horrible. <laughs> but people enjoy hunting. And so I learned the strategy of hunting but I didn't really like the activity of hunting. And so understanding the strategy of hunting, I learned that there are certain, in order to hunt certain things, you can't just do, you can't do everything the same way. It depends on what you're hunting. 
and where you're hunting. And I understand there's something about quail. They're different than other birds because you just like a duck, you can go, go quack, quack, and then they'll fly up, and then boom, you got them. But quails are very apprehensive. They don't, they don't trust easily. And so what you learn is that you can't make a sound and make a quail just fly up so you can get it. You literally, literally have to trap quail. So what people have learned is that they take wheat. They take what the quail loves, and they'll drop the wheat in different places way away from the trap that they've already set. They don't want the quail to pick up a scent. They don't want the quail to pick up a hint. They want the quail to get used to enjoying the thing that it loves. So what they do on the second, what, what they do on the first day, they lay out all, the, all of the, the wheat, and they leave. The quail comes, and the quail will look at the wheat. The quail will look around. The quail will step away. He doesn't just, he doesn't just come in and just eat because, once again, he's apprehensive. He's careful. He's smart. And so the quail won't just jump in and eat, so he'll look at the wheat. Then he'll leave, and then he'll come back, and he'll look some more, and eventually he'll eat the wheat. The next day, they bring the wheat to a different location, just a little bit farther away from where the quail found the first one, but closer to the trap. And this process continues day by day, but just a little bit here, just a little bit there, and eventually the quail will drop its apprehension. The quail will stop thinking about the danger. The quail will only focus in on the safety of enjoying what it really wants. It enjoys the good thing. Eventually, the hunter will place the wheat right inside the trap. But because the, 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 the quail has enjoyed the wheat so many days, unmolested, unhurt, unbothered, the quail walks right into the trap, enjoys the good thing, doors closed, and now it's trapped. And that's exactly where we can find this church. So I ask myself the question as I'm studying for this text, can good things lead to a wrong direction? See, the quail was doing what it was, what it was normally going to do. It's not inherently wrong for quail to eat wheat. It's not wrong for quail to go to where it normally goes anyway. But because the quail dropped its guard and followed the right thing in the right place, it ended up making the wrong decision. These were people who were in the right place. He's writing the message to the church, not to the world. They were in the right place, doing the right things, but got caught up and ended up in the wrong way. So my question still remains, can good things lead in the wrong direction? And I've come up with a conclusion, indeed they can, because Christians are led to give up their high standards by degrees, often as uh, by a compl uh, instead of us just jumping into stuff, little bit by little bit, we'll get comfortable with things. And next thing you know, as Joe Cruz called it, we have creeping compromise. And that's where we find this church, and of course the church aligns itself with the name, the Church of Compromise. This is what was happening in that area. We find that this particular letter shows us the slippery slope of sin. If you remember the first church, Ephesus, Ephesus lost its first love. They got distracted, and they decided that we, 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 since we got distracted, their city got overwhelmed with mud, and now no blessings could even come into the city. Then we went to Smyrna. And, and we learned that Smyrna was a church that was being persecuted. And Jesus had nothing bad to say about this church. He had no charge against them. At the same time, he said, I just need you to hold on until these 10 days are up. And then your help is going to be there. Just hold on. And now we see the church in, in Pergamum, they're now coming out of persecution. And because they don't want to be persecuted anymore, they do something that we typically do, and that's simply go along just to what? Get along. Y'all are with me today. 
And before you know it, you're in a position that you never thought you'd be in. This is something that the, that the, the letter says. It said that you're in the seat of Satan. I want to rest there just for a second because I need you to really understand where they were. Can you imagine Satan just setting up shop in your house? Somebody say, yeah, I can definitely imagine, Pastor. I can imagine. The devil decides to come to your house and just set up shop. But somehow, some way, you find the spiritual fortitude to still praise God. Remember what the word said. He said that I, I'm happy for the fact that you have continued to serve me, even though Satan has set up shop in the middle of your living room. What do you do when your household has just gone completely crazy? See, this is why I'm not really swayed or, 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 or impressed by people who can put on a good show. I'm not really impressed uh, by people who, 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 who's, who profess to be Christians or, or, or profess their diet or profess what they don't do. I'm impressed by the person who can treat the janitor the same way they treat the CEO. That's what impresses me. I'm impressed by what a person does as a person to what a person, their, their profession is. I'm impressed by a person who can uphold a standard and you can still stand them. And I thought about that because Moses came down off the mountain. Remember, Moses was talking to God, and God was writing the, the tables of stone, or, or the commandments on the table of stone with his own finger, and, 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 and God heard a rambling going down there. Moses was caught up in worship, and God heard the rambling, and, and God said, oh, no, I'm getting ready to just go and wipe these people out. Moses says, wait a minute. Let me go down there and talk to them. <laughs> Moses goes down. He confronts them. Breaks up the idol, the golden calf, melted down, and still made them drink it, and they still followed him. See, that's a person upholding a standard, and you can still stand them. Some of us want to hold up a standard, and nobody likes us at all, period. People don't even talk behind your back anymore. They just tell you, I don't like you. I'm also impressed by a person who can act holy up in here, up in here, and not be a hell raiser when they get home. Yeah, I'm impressed by that. He said, your city, your, your city is the seat of Satan. And as I read this, I, and I did a study for this, I, I looked at it, and I saw where these Scholars were saying that, you know, it was called the seat of Satan because they had all these pagan uh, uh, rituals there. They had all these pagan places, and, and there was this place where they would come and they would make offerings to Zeus. And because they were making offerings to Zeus, then, of course, that, that would mean that that's the seat of Satan because the false god was there. I, I don't want you to be tricked. The devil does not care who you worship as long as you're not worshiping God. Hear me clearly on this. Let him that has ear hear what the preacher's trying to tell you. He don't care what you call your God as long as it's not Jesus. So I want you to understand something. When we talk about the seat of Satan, I need you to understand, get your mind off of an individual, off of a, a particular statue, a thing. I need you to understand that God is talking about a complete system that has set up shop right in the middle of God's church. How do I know this? Revelation 13, verse 1 and 2. Then I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. It had seven heads and then ten horns and ten crowns on its horns. And written on its each head were names that blaspheme God. 
This beast looked like a leopard, but it had uh, uh, the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, the who everybody? The dragon gave the beast his own power and throne and great authority. So what the Bible is teaching us in Revelation 13 is that the seat of Satan is not necessarily a particular place, but it's a system that has been set up to fool the people of God. And it's amazing to me how sometimes when we teach prophecy, we start telling you about all these other things and not really give you the real deal of what's really happening. The Bible tells you where the throne, uh, uh, it gives you a great idea and a clue about that throne. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the dragon. We're going to talk a little bit more about the beast as we go throughout these lessons. But I want you to understand something here. That Rome is where the power was at the time. Rome is where the corruption was at the time. And if you read Daniel, the book that was sealed, and then you come over and read Revelation, the book that was opened, then you understand that this system still exists today. It still has power. It still has authority. And the Bible has declared that it's going to give that authority to the beast. I'm excited right now. But you got to come back and get the rest of that. <laughs> Jesus said that they did, not deny G they, they did not deny him even when Antipas. Now, understand that Antipas in the Greek simply means like the father. So there was one who was like the father that was, cruci that was uh, killed. And because he was killed, you need to understand what was happening with this particular thing. Back then, you could get executed by an executioner who would, you put your head on the little thing, the guillotine there, and they would take and go, whoom. And that would be the execution. But there were also powers who had the rule of the sword, the word of the sword. And basically what the word of the sword meant is that by their word, you would be executed on the spot. You did not have a chance to go to jail. You couldn't pass go collect $200. You were killed on the spot. And because it was swift, it was not, they were not going to take you to the guillotine. They would just take the sword and kill you right then and there. So what Jesus does, he said that even when, they're, when they kill the one who is like the father, you still didn't budge. There's a level of faithfulness about this church. So this is my thing. They kept, all, they, they, they kept all of the rules. They practiced all of the rituals. So how did they get tripped up and compromised? Because they did not keep their relationship. And that, my friend, is a prophetic word right there. Because it's that relationship that's going to help you in those moments when rules are challenged, when rituals are diminished, it's that relationship that's going to keep you. So I wonder to myself sometimes, is it possible to keep all the right rules and do all the right rituals and still end up wrong? He mentions Balaam in this story. And it's amazing that he, that he pulls this character out of antiquity and puts him right here in this situation. You guys remember Balaam, right? Balaam was the prophet over in Numbers uh, chapter 22 through 24. And Balaam was hired by the king of the Moabite king, Balak, to, to, uh, to go and curse the children of Israel. Now, there's a word here, and I want you to listen to this word. I told you I've got a word today. And this right here, if you, if you, if you decide to jump up and shout, don't, 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 the rest of us won't be afraid because we understand what you're going through right now. Understand this, that this was a guy who was hired by our government yeah, yeah, yeah. to infiltrate the people of God and to curse them. Yeah, yeah. Under, uh, Balaam understood something, though. Balaam understood that no man can curse what God has already blessed. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. 
I need you to understand today that, and the problem is that we don't understand that we're really blessed. That's why we're worried about what's happening. That's why we're bothered about things that man is doing because we don't have the understanding that man cannot curse what God has already blessed. I don't care what it looks like on your job. I don't care what it looks like in your household. If you are a blessed person by God, there's nothing Satan can do. But Balaam also understood something. Balaam understood that you can't get God to move away from the people, but you can get the people to move away from God. Oh, yeah. So Balaam came up with this sinister plan and, and, and this diabolical plot. He told the king, he said, well, all you have to do is just get them enticed. See, you can't beat them with war. And we've learned that you can't beat them, you what? Join them. So well, all you got to do, king, is just entice them and let them know that you're so nice and they'll come over and hang out with you. And the more that they hang out with you, the less they're going to hang out with their God. Do you know that same strategy still works? When the devil can't get you to just give up on God by putting you through tribulations and troubles, he'll let up and let somebody come into your life that seemed like the greatest thing. And the next thing you know, you're doing stuff that you know that you shouldn't do. Go places you know that you shouldn't go. And be okay with it. Yeah, because the Spirit's going to talk to you. The Spirit of God is going to talk to you and say, hey, Shields, no, nah, man, you shouldn't do that. And Shields going to say, oh, it's all right, just a little bit. Not very much, a little bit by little bit by little bit. So now we understand that he's talking, and you guys remember the story how, how when, 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 when Balak followed what Balaam said, the children of Israel, they wandered after new gods. They, they committed idolatry, which means that they had other idols. They worshiped other gods. And we know the story that when they, start, when they left God, then they were susceptible to the curses which brought about the plagues. God never left them but they left God. They didn't all leave the same day, but little bit by little bit. So something strange happened here in Pergamum. They inched a little bit here and a little bit there and found themselves compromising. See, when Constantine legalized Christianity, the church chose pacifism over persecution. Rather than taking a stand for what is right, the church decided to conform to what's happening right now. There's a danger in trying to be relevant. God has not called his church to be relevant. God has called his church to be the light of the world, which means that you can't become dark to fight darkness. Whatever little spark of light that you have, you use that. Don't become like the darkness to fight the darkness. Someone once said that there were more idols in that city than shingles on the rooftops. In our previous sermons, we've talked about language arts and we've talked about mathematics and statistics and, and all that other stuff. But today we're going to talk about uh, history just for a second, just for a moment, just for history. You, you, you still with me? Wake your neighbor up. Tell them it's okay. Just wake up. Wake up. Wake up. You need this. See, in the year 305, Constantine was overlooked as a replacement for the emperor position. And at that time, there was a four-man ruling body. But through a series of events, Constantine was named the emperor and became the only ruling power. His legacy was in bringing about unification. He unified the, emp the empire and gave the Christian, God, the Christian God the credit for his victorious battle. Somewhere around 313 to the early 320s, the Emperor Constantine used his theology to bring an end to the persecution of Christians. You see how they're leaving Smyrna 
persecuted church. And now they're coming from persecution into simply conforming, following a counterfeit. And you can summarize Constantine's life in the terms of conquest for unity. Apparently, he had a religious experience in, in which uh, uh, God told him to have the emperor's army paint a Christian emblem on their shields and, and lead them into war, and they would have the victory. An important historical fact is that Constantine wrote letters sharing his Christian theology to the Roman representative who was in Africa, in Africa, and where everybody in Africa at the time in reference to the Christian clergy not being distracted by secular offices for their religious duties. This is what it said. For when they are free to render supreme service to the divinity, it is evident that they confer great benefit upon the affairs of the state. He is unifying the church and the state. Are you with me now? Not yet. Okay. Now I need you to understand something here. Just a brief break. That he wrote this letter, he began this campaign in 313 to the early 320s writing a succession of letters to Africa, to Carthage, to different places over there. Which helped me to understand that the first time that Africans heard about Jesus was not in 1526. Can you hear me now? So understand, don't believe what you're hearing from other people. This gospel message has been in Africa since the first century. I have a video on all that good stuff there. So go to YouTube, look it up. It's already there. Constantine, just like most Roman citizens, most Roman uh, uh, politicians at that time, believed that his political success was directly tied to his religious piety, which means that as long as he's proclaiming God, he's going to be victorious. Notice I didn't say worshiping God, but proclaiming God. The louder I get about this God, the more victorious I am. Constantine is noted for bringing a few things together in unity. As I said earlier, he brought the empire into unity. He brought the, uh, the church and state into unity. He brought paganism and Christianity into unity. He marched his entire army through a river saying that they were being baptized. Without teaching them anything about Jesus, he kept the rituals and understood the rules and didn't have a relationship, marched his army through the river and said, now you guys are baptized. People became Christians because the government said so. Then Christianity became fashionable, and everybody's doing it, and, and they're just simply going through the motions and picking up all these rituals. Eventually, Christianity went from being fashionable to becoming a fad. Even people who were not taught or baptized called themselves and identified themselves as Christians. It was good to be a Christian at that time. With the explosive migration to Christianity, the pagan priests found themselves in trouble. And they didn't want to lose their jobs. So what did they do? They simply baptized their paganism and brought it right into the church. They brought their robes and trinkets and idols into the church. They baptized their idols and gave them Christian names like St. Peter, St. Paul, and St. John. They took the female pagan god who had the sun uh, shining behind her head and called her Mary. Another pagan tradition is when uh, the, the Samarians, who allegedly conceived a son named Tammuz immaculately, she is pictured holding a baby in her arms. The pagans baptized her and changed her from being a heavenly virgin queen to the heavenly virgin mother and named her the Virgin Mary. Constantine wanted to unify traditions, so he took the pagan day of sun worship, baptized it, and called it Sabbath. I've got a word for you, though. Jesus said, that if you 
don't say something, I'm going to say something. He said, I'm going to use the two-edged sword. We understand from Hebrews, the two-edged sword is the word. I want you to understand something about that sword before we go any farther. If you look at the full armor of God, everything there is for a defensive, to defend you, to protect you. There's only one thing in that whole list that's an offensive weapon. And guess what that is? The sword. So understand, you can only fight with the word of God. Now, I know that some of us have our self-help books. There are places for all that. But you have to encounter spiritual things on a spiritual level. And so Jesus said, if you look at the text, it starts out with this is the one who has the double-edged sword. Let me read it. Verse 12. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Pergamum. This is the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. Jesus is saying that I'm the one with the word. Back in the day, we used to have this commercial. And don't date yourself because if you're old as I am, you understand what I'm about to say. The commercial about E.F. Hudden. And they would say that when E.F. Hudden speaks, everybody listens. And it should be like that for Christians when Jesus speaks. That when Jesus speaks, all his people should listen. If you look at the text, every one of these texts, he goes down and he says, let him that have ear do what? Come on now. So when Jesus speaks, we got to listen. The first thing I want you to do, to, uh, uh, li uh, list for you today if you're taking notes, with, and hopefully this will help us unravel the co-mingling of these truths with error. And we can kind of help some people with the compromise that has crept its way into God's church. Number one thing you see in this text is that they talk about the worship and how people started to just worship different, uh, baptize different idols. And as they began to baptize different idols, they gave them names, St. Paul, St. Peter, St. John. Well, I want you to understand something. The disciples never wanted to be accepted, never wanted or even accepted prayer or worship from anyone. As a matter of fact, they taught us that you can go to God directly. I know somebody's upset by that word. So you don't need to ask a statue anything. You don't even have to ask your pastor anything. Yeah, you don't. Do you know? That if you go to God yourself, that God will hear you? You can simply fall down on your knees, open up your own mouth, and pour out your own heart before the throne of grace, and God will hear you. The word declares that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. If we humans give our children good gifts, then how much so will God, our Father in heaven, give his children good gifts? We can cut out the middleman. You don't need to pray to Mary, Joseph, John, Peter. You can call upon him yourself. There's an old song that says you can call him up. Call him up whenever you want. It says that I've got a phone in my bosom, and I can call him from my heart. Call him up, call him up, and tell him what you want. You, you, when you're sick and can't get well, it says call him up and tell him what you want. Someone on the Sabbath school line today encouraged my soul. And I say, oh, man, they're preaching this sermon. I don't have to. We can just play the reel of the Sabbath school back. They'll get everything that I'm talking about here. And she talked about, Sister Kay talked about how she didn't call anybody because it was late at night and she was in pain. And she just started to call out to God and start praising God. And she was able to sleep. I love you, but I'm probably not going to ask you to call at one in the morning. I'm going to take probably, I'm not going to answer your call at 1 in the morning. I'll call you to a normal business hour. But you can call to God all day long. He never sleeps nor slumbers. I remember right there on, on Mount Carmel when 
when, when the prophet was talking to all the other priests and they were doing all of this stuff, all the renting and the raving, yeah. cutting themselves and, and just doing all kind of stuff. And he leans over and says, well, maybe uh, your God's in the bathroom or maybe he's asleep. But we serve a God, the true and living God, who never sleeps nor slumbers. He never takes a day off. He never gets sick. He's always on call, all day long, all night long. Whenever you need him, you can go to him directly. Now, there's nothing wrong with you thinking you can't call the pastor. You can call me. I'll pray with you. But I don't want you to depend on my prayer for you. I need you to be able to go to God because you might need to pray for me one day. But do you know there's a system that teaches that you have to come to man in order to get to God? A religious system, not a worldly system. But I want everybody that's here online under the sound of my voice to understand that God never set it up so that you have to go to somebody else. You don't have to pray to a statue to get favor with God. You can go God directly. I don't have to confess my sins to you. You're going to have it all over the church. But I can go to God. Second thing I want to leave with you today. This may surprise you. But Mary is no longer a virgin. She's not. I got biblical proof. I've got a word. I'm telling you right now, I've got a word. So don't become a, a casualty of these confusing counterfeits. Turn with me real quick. Matthew 13, verse 55 through 56. Matthew 15, Matthew 13, 55 through 56. This is what it says. Is not, the carpent, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his what? Brethren. Then it starts to name them. James and Jose, Ho, uh, Jose yeah, Hoses and Simon and Judas. Verse 56 said that he had sisters. And, and, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? Now let me ask you a question. The only one that came from an immaculate conception was Jesus. So where do other, other folks come from if he had brothers and sisters? That means Joseph and Mary got married. They did what married folks do. So she's no longer a virgin. So if the, if the value is found in the virgin Mary, then I understand there's no value because she's no longer a virgin. So I can't hang my hat on asking Mary to go to Christ for me based on her virginity. I can only, as I said in the first point, go to God directly myself. A trainee is placed in a room with stacks of money. He's told to count all the money. He spends the day counting ones, fives, tens, and so on. And he counts stacks of mixed bills for hours. The next day, he does the same thing, counting hundreds, twenties, fives, fifties, tens, and ones, hour after hour. The, this continues for days at a time, and one day, a counterfeit bill is slipped in. He still counts the money, 400, 401, 2, 3, 4, 441, 450, 461, and he finally reaches the counterfeit money. He stops counting. He knows that something is wrong. He may not know exactly what's wrong. He can't go to court and testify that something is wrong. But he knows in his mind that something is wrong. It is something that's called intimate familiarity. And intimate familiarity is key, especially for us as Christians, because he is so familiar with the real thing that he can identify the counterfeit without even thinking about it. 
He is so familiar with the touch, with the feel, with the look of the money that when his hands hit something that doesn't, it just doesn't, it just doesn't feel right. We should be so intimately inclined with Jesus that when something comes our way, it may sound good, it may look good, but we need to have that familiarity so much so that something just doesn't feel right with that thing. So if I'm praying to a statue and I'm calling it the virgin mother, but it's no longer a virgin, guess what I'm doing? Spinning my wheel. And I'm not taking light anybody's tradition. Because you don't know what a person's been taught. But what I want people to understand is just like this church, we can creep ourselves right into compromise and not even know it. The last thing I want to leave with you today is that the Sabbath is still the seventh day of the week. And I can prove it. See, some say that the Ten Commandments are done away with or they've been nailed to the cross, even if that was true, which is not true. There was a Sabbath before there was a Sinai. Did you hear what I just said? Before God wrote the Sabbath on a table of stone with Moses on the mountain, he spoke the Sabbath into existence out of his own mouth when he was in the Garden of Eden with Adam. So before there was a Sinai, there was a Sabbath. And even before there was a sin, there was a Sabbath. I told you I've got a word. So understand that if the commandments of God were nailed to the cross, then what I have, what I have problems with is that how did it exist before there was a sin? Some say that the new covenant eliminates the Sabbath of the old covenant. Psalm 89, 34. You can write it down. Psalm 89, 34. God said, my covenant I will not break nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Some people say, Pastor, that's cool, but that's the Old Testament. Let me drop some New Testament on you then. Luke 16, 17, Jesus said, It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one, jo- one tittle of the law to fail. That's New Testament right there. So some say that the Sabbath is just for the Jews and ended with the crucifixion of Jesus. New Testament again, Acts chapter 13. Now I'm going to ask you a question. When Luke wrote Acts, was it before or after the crucifixion? It was after the crucifixion. I'll go and help you. I'll give you. It's an open book test, so I'll give you the answers. It was after the crucifixion. So what Luke is expressing to us is are things that are happening after Jesus had uh, uh, died and risen from the grave. So this is what he said after the crucifixion. When the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them when? The next Sabbath. Say, what? But I thought it was over when Jesus died. I thought it was just for the Jews. But here are the Gentiles showing up on the next Sabbath asking for the word of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. You can find that Acts 13, verse 42 and 44. Here's another one, Acts 18, verse 4. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks after the crucifixion. Oh, I got a word for you. Some people even say, We should keep Sunday in honor of the resurrection of Jesus. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 6. Do you know, and this is what God is doing. Remember he told Pergamon, he said, if you don't get your act together, I'm going to send my own word. So you you don't have to worry about the preacher. You can go right here and get it directly yourself. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 6, is what the Word of God says. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in his likeness, in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Paul is letting us know that if you want to honor Christ's resurrection, that you get baptized. Not change a day to a Sabbath. Some people also say, here's a question. Doesn't the Bible say don't judge people about the Sabbath? Great question. I love that question. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 through 17. Let no man judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or the Sabbath days. S. Sabbath days. As a matter of fact, if you look in your Bible, you see that it's lowercase Sabbath with the S at the end. Now get this. Even if you have not had, if you don't understand Greek or Hebrew, you've not understood Bible prophecy, I want you to get this. Verse 17 says, which are a shadow. A what, everybody? A shadow. Are you with me? It's a what? A shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. See, the Sabbath was created, since the Sabbath was created before sin, the Sabbath can be actually be taken out of this particular equation. Because if something is a shadow of things to come, then that means we're looking forward to what's going to happen. Now, trick question. Why did Jesus have to come? Because we sinned, right? Yeah. And so things that were in place that were a shadow of him coming were in place to show what he was going to do when he got here. He died for our sins. So that means that there is a ceremonial law that we no longer have to worry about because all of that pointed to Christ, what he was going to accomplish. This is why we no longer have to have ourselves going and killing animals anymore. Are you with me? But the moral law still stands to this very day. The ceremonial law was done away with, if you remember, go back and read it. Check me on this. It said that when Jesus died, that a hand came out of nowhere and ripped the veil of the sanctuary from the top to the bottom. Why? Because now it's no longer necessary. All of the sanctification, the justification, and eventually the glorification is found in Jesus Christ. That's why we no longer have to sacrifice animals. That's why we no longer have to deal with the feast days. All of that was pointing towards Jesus Christ. And the feast days were called Sabbath days. So that's what the Bible was talking about, what the Bible is talking about. Colossians chapter 2, go back and read it. Next question that people say, that I get is, is the ceremonial law and the moral, moral law the same? Deuteronomy chapter 4. We're getting ready to go into the next Sabbath school quarterly talking about Deuteronomy, so make sure you get your Sabbath school lesson. If you don't have your lesson, you go online, uh, 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 sharing sda.net, go there, and you'll see where the Sabbath school lesson is online right there. Here, here it is, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 13 through 14. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even ten commandments. And he wrote them upon two tablets of stone. Now let me ask you this. Who's talking here? Moses, right? Moses is talking. Who is Moses talking about writing something? God, right? God took the time to write commandments on a table of stone, and Moses identified them as even the ten commandments, right? Right? That's, for, that's in your Bible, right? All right. If it's not, you need to throw that Bible away and go get you a real one. Verse 14 says, And the Lord commanded me, who is me? Moses, right? 
at that time to teach you statues and judgments that ye might do them in the land whether you go over to possess it. Just in case you didn't catch it, the moral law was God taking the time to write it on the table of stone with his finger. The ceremonial law was Moses writing it with his finger. Moses and God, are they the same person? Thank you. Case closed. The ceremonial law and the moral law are not the same thing. How do I also know this? It's another question. But, uh, uh, has it, but hasn't time been lost and the days of the week changed since the time of Christ? No. Scholars do agree that there were two changes to the calendar, but never the succession of seven days. Never. There were changes to the calendar, changing one day to another day, the 10th to like the 15th or 16th, the Gregorian calendar. Just go look that up. Gregorian calendar. Gregory, Gregorian calendar. Go look that up. And that was one of the changes, but never in the succession of days. First day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, seventh day has always been since creation. Last question that I get. Well, I'll get more questions, but this, I don't want to keep you here all day. Will the Sabbath remain forever? Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. And this is why I believe that the devil does not want us to read the book of Revelation. I think that he wants us to believe that it's so complicated that we can't understand it. Yes, we, we can understand it. We can. It's not scary stuff. We hear about beasts and all that stuff there, but I promise you, you want to dig into this thing and have a complete understanding. Revelation chapter 11, verse 19 says, Then in heaven, the temple of God was opened and the ark of the covenant. Remember I told you when we read that scripture in the beginning that I was going to come back there? Here we are. The ark of the covenant could be seen inside of, uh, inside the temple. You're not shouting yet. Okay, let me come and get you then. Revelation 18 says, then in heaven, in where? In heaven. When you read Revelation 18, I mean Revelation 11, you'll see that this is coming to the culmination of this earth, which means that God is finishing up business here, transitioning everything to heaven. So when we get to verse 19, then in heaven, the temple of God was opened. So when he opened the temple that was in heaven, remember the temple down here was ripped, right? Yeah, it was ripped, so it was no longer needed. But the temple down here was a model of what was already in heaven. So the thing that is in heaven is still there. And it said, and the ark of the covenant could be seen inside the temple. Remember we talked about in Pergamum, he talked about the manna. And I took you back to the sanctuary, how you go, to, you go from the court. And from the court, you go into the holy place, the, the ver very first compartment, the holy place. And then you have uh, some furniture there. Then you go into the most holy place. When you get to the most holy place, there's one piece of furniture there called the Ark of the Covenant. And that's where God's mercy seat. And that's where we hear the word, the, the word Shekinah glory. It's a source without anything to do with man, a source of light that's only given by God to show that God's presence is there. So God's presence is there on the mercy seat, sitting on the Ark of the Covenant, which is still in the temple in heaven. Still not with me yet. Okay. In the Ark of the Covenant, you've got the manna. You've got... Uh, Aaron's bud that that uh, uh, that Aaron's rod that budded. Not with me yet. Okay, that's what we call the health message. Yeah, but we'll get to that later on too. What else is there? You got the bowl of manna. You got Aaron's rod that that budded. You got grain. You got fruits. The original diet. You go back to Genesis. You see what they ate in the original diet. What grains and fruit. Next thing you see there. Is on the outside, there is a compartment, and there is the ceremonial law that's standing on the outside of the covenant of God. But on the inside, when you open it up on the inside, you're going to see the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. 
I want to help you here understand something. That when God wrote these Ten Commandments on the tablet of stone, God is so miraculous that when he took his finger and wrote it, you could see how, you, how I would see it on this side, but you on this side would see it exactly how it would be on this side. He didn't have to turn it over. So no matter from which angle you saw it, you were able to understand what God was saying. That's how intentional he was about his, his word. So he put it into the Ark of the Covenant to help us understand that it will not, it won't change. And what's important about this is the understanding that it's in the temple, in heaven, at the, uh, in, the, in the Ark of his covenant, which means that if God's covenant still stands in heaven, then the Ten Commandments still reign in heaven. And if the Ten Commandments still are in heaven, guess what else is in heaven? Number four, the Sabbath is still in heaven. And we're going to worship him, the Bible says, from Sabbath to Sabbath. Every day won't be Sunday. Sabbath will have an end. But we look forward to the next Sabbath when we'll get to worship again. Now, does that mean that you, can, you can't worship on Tuesday? You can worship on Monday, Tuesday, whatever day you want to worship on. But God has called one day special. Don't allow the compromise to come in and creep. Most people do it and they don't even understand what they're doing. They don't know that it was a political thing being married to a religious thing when the state and religion come together, state and the church comes together and makes a rule of law that says that this is what's going to happen. Do you know that that's going to happen again? And just like with this church, Jesus is warning us that if we don't pay attention, we're going to be just like those quail. We're going to go a little bit here, a little bit there, until we're inside the trap and we're going to be shut up. But he says, I got a word for you. He started out to the church by saying, I am the one with the double-edged sword. I am the one with the word that's coming directly out of my mouth. I'm the one. You understand that God's word has creative power, right? So when God speaks, it means something. And so what he said to the church is that I know your works. He said, I know that you've been faithful. You didn't even run when, when, when Antipas, when one like the father was killed. You didn't run. But this argument that I have against you is that you have compromised your relationship with me. And if God has taken the time to write on a tablet of stone, and he writes his contract, he said it's his, his covenant and then when I say that it doesn't matter, what I'm really saying is that my relationship status with God doesn't matter. I may as well go ahead and update my Facebook page to my status and say it's complicated. And when I have a firm relationship with Jesus Christ and I say that, Lord, what you say does matter, then I don't have to worry about anything else coming my way. I don't have to worry about the latest, greatest thing that's happening. I don't have to worry about what the church is doing now, how the church is being relevant. I don't have to worry about what, 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 what we're bringing into the church and baptizing and calling it holy now. Because I am not stuck with rules. I am not stuck with rituals. I am enamored with my relationship with God. So let him that have ear hear the word of God. And Jesus told them that if you don't get yourself together, I'm going to send my word myself. Wouldn't it be a shame if God's church refused to get itself together and God had to have another way to get his gospel to people who want to be saved? That would be a horrible thing. So I want you to understand something. That the devil's counterfeit initially looks like the real thing, but it's fake. A counterfeit faith stops where man's capacity ends. A biblical faith begins where man stops. A counterfeit faith depends on appearance, coercion, and deception. 
A biblical faith depends on a reliability on Christ. A counterfeit faith insists upon its authenticity. A biblical faith says, by their fruit you shall know them. A counterfeit faith focuses on experience. A biblical faith looks unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. A counterfeit faith offers you the world. A biblical faith offers you life and the life to come. A counterfeit faith breeds enslavement, destruction, and ruin. A biblical faith gives freedom. This is why I never say that the Sabbath or the Ten Commandments are still binding. No, it's, they've, they've never been binding. How can you, a Seventh-day Adventist preacher, say that it's never been binding? Because the Bible says that it's liberty, it's freedom. You can't be held by something that's freeing you from something. You're free to love God. You're free to love people. You're free to live your life when you live your life with the standards that have been set up by God. A counterfeit faith offers what it cannot produce. A biblical faith produces what you cannot create. The very fact that you're sitting here with somebody who probably would have robbed you last night is a miracle. That's what biblical faith does. It creates things that, that, that were not normally going to happen. A counterfeit faith is man-centered. A biblical faith is Christ-centered. Any religion, any religious system that promotes Christ but does not practice Christ is a counterfeit. It's not enough for us to just say that we're gung-ho for Jesus. At some point, we have to exercise our relationship with Jesus. And as I get ready to take my seat, I just want you to know today that even though this church compromised, guess what Jesus did? He never left them. One of my favorite authors put it this way. The church, as frail as she may be, is still the apple of God's eye. So people who are contemplating about leaving church because it's not the way you think it should be, I never, ever, 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 except for one time heard of a person who was in a ship and there was a storm and said, throw me overboard. And that was a person who was running from God. Don't leave the ship just because things are shaky. Don't leave the ship because there's a storm around the church, this old ship called Zion. This is the ark of safety. This is where you're supposed to be. Let me ask you a question that the Holy Spirit had to ask me when I was trying to decide what I was going to do. And I like how God deals with me. God's very frank with me. God said, where else are you going to go? If you leave me, what else are you going to do? What are your options, Shields? Be real with us. What are your options? The club? All that means nothing if I don't have Jesus. So today, my, my appeal is simply this. You've got to have a come to Jesus moment for yourself right now. Those of you who are online, those of you who are right here with us today, you've got to have a come to Jesus moment with yourself right now. And you know for yourself if you've been compromising. You know for yourself if you've done just a little bit, just a little bit, just a little bit. And I promise you, the farther and the more you do out there, the least and the less little bit you're going to do in here. That's just how it balances out. You've gone away from God. You, maybe you were in an Ephesus state where you lost your first love. You were hot for Jesus. You were, you were ready to do something. And, and, and we failed you as a church, and we didn't hear your cry. We didn't minister to you correctly. We didn't handle you correctly. We said something crazy to you, and you left, or you wanted to leave, or you got one foot out the door. Maybe you're in Smyrna right now. You, you're being persecuted. You, 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 you're dealing with so much stuff right now that you can barely even lift your head up off the pillow in the morning. Maybe you're in this Pergamum state where you just want to go along to get along. You want the pain to stop so badly that you're willing to go along with anything. 
You don't want to be talked about. You don't want to be disliked. You don't want to be persecuted. But just like those quail, we, we've gone just a little bit here, just a little bit there, and we find ourselves being held captive. If you read that text, Jesus never said that I'm tired of you. You've gone too far. He does tell them you need to repent, which means that even in their worst state, they had an opportunity to turn around. I got to warn you. Just because you're opening up your heart again to God, there's still some people here that are going to talk to you crazy. There are people at your job that talk to you crazy, but you still go. Because you see the benefit in the paycheck. I want you to see the benefit in your salvation. No man died for me. So no man is going to run me away from God's church. Guys, we can no longer walk the line and be over here sometime and be over there sometime. We can't allow compromise to come into God's church and baptize it and say it's okay. Because the more we compromise, the less we are depending on God to be faithful to his word. Because if Jesus, we believe that Jesus is going to handle his business and get us out then we're not worried about what the world is doing. We're not worried about what's happening. Let me give you something for this week. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Christ. Do that. So whether you're a man, woman, boy, girl, if something that you've heard today has pricked your heart and you know that you need to come to God directly, you know that there's some, you may not have been dealing with idols, but there's some other stuff out there that you've, been, that you've already put before Jesus. Maybe it's your, your, your ego that you put before Christ. Maybe it's your pocketbook that you put, your bank account, you put that before Christ, whatever it is. And also I need you to understand that when we talk about the Sabbath, it is when we find rest in Jesus Christ. So today, you may be making a decision, saying to yourself, I want to follow God all the way. Today, I want to open up the doors of the church. I'm not going to ask you to come up because we have the COVID protocol. But what I do want you to do is say this prayer with me. And I want you to position yourself in a way that you can allow God to use you right now today. Remember in the previous sermon we talked about, we told you, don't worry about getting yourself together. God will do that. You just need to come and be faithful. Have you always done things right? No. Are you going to do some more wrong? Yes. Perfection is only found in the safety and uh, arms of Jesus Christ. So today as we pray, open up your heart. Give God your heart. And allow him that has begun a good work in you to see it through to completion. One of these days, we're going to have a way to connect with you so that when you make that decision, we can follow up with you right away. But what I want you to do for right now is contact our church office on Wednesday, because I'll be here on Wednesday. And let's have a conversation about what the next steps look like on your journey to Jesus, your journey with Jesus. Not your journey to Jesus, but your journey with Jesus. You can find our number, our email, right here. Thank you so much for worshiping. Online. Uh, Sharon. Please subscribe to our services on YouTube or Facebook. That way you can get notifications of events that are happening in our church. We have a, uh, like our Friday night services that are taking place. In other services, what we want you to do is contact our church office via email with the title of the subject line saying uh, Sabbath. And give us your, your information so we'll know how to send it, send it to you. And we'll send it to you. For those who want a deeper understanding of the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel and prophecy, 
We're putting together something that's an initiative called Walking with Faith. And you got to be, well, right now what we want to do is going to be a life group where we come together. And every day, on a certain time, we're going to walk, get some exercise as we literally go through the book of Revelation. And when we do that, it's going to help us get healthy spiritually, but also healthy physically. But for those of you saying, well, I'll be work, I may do this, we'll be able to, to re record those things and you're able to access it. But we're going to trust that you're going to walk because the purpose of it is to walk with the word. So those are some things that are coming our way. But we have the ebook right now about the Sabbath. If you want to learn more about that from a biblical perspective, not from my perspective, but from a biblical perspective, then reach out to us on our email. Uh, you can find our email at SharonSDA.net. You guys can go there real quick and um, send, our, send an email with the subject line Sabbath, and we'll send you that ebook. We'll make sure that, that, that you get that. So let's pray. Dear Lord, we need you now more than ever before. We find ourselves, oh Lord, confirm, con, con, just being confused about some stuff. Some things we were not even taught. Some of us, this is just brand new information. But let us be mindful that the word comes forth from the revelation of Jesus, which means that it is you who is being revealed and you're also revealing yourself to us there are some compromises oh Lord that we've made we're sorry some of them oh Lord we don't even know how to get ourselves out of but today we come to you because your word has declared that you are a way maker and although we may not know the way you know the way Today, O oh Lord, your word has declared that we ask that you would give. So we're asking, O oh Lord, for you to take us and shape us for your kingdom. Your word has declared, O oh Lord, to knock. So we're knocking, pleading, O oh Lord, for you to take our lives, give us purpose, and continue, O oh Lord, to give us hope. Also, Lord, forgive us of our sins. And we accept the atoning sacrifice of Jesus right now. And when we open up our eyes, oh Lord, we are now new creatures in Christ. All of our sins have been passed away. They're gone and remembered no more. And we accept that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. We also thank you for your donation, your generous giving, whether it's been by mail, cash app, or online. Please subscribe to our services on YouTube or Facebook. That way you can get notifications of events that are happening within our church, like our Friday night services that are taking place and other services and special events. Once again, we thank you for being with us today. And we look forward to worshiping with you soon in person. Coming to Sharon Seventh-day Adventist Church, where the arms of Christ are always open. God bless you.